Hi everyone, my name is Nathan Eastwood. I'm a freelance R developer based in Amsterdam, and today I'm going to be introducing my data manipulation package, Poor Man. When working in R, it's very common that we need to do some data manipulation, regardless of which field or discipline you might be working in. And the great thing about R is that we've actually got quite a few different options to do this. We've got base R itself, we've got dplyr, we've got data table. Like I say, today I'm going to be introducing my package, Poor Man and hopefully by the end of this talk, you'll have a good understanding of why I think that there's a gap in this data manipulation market, so why it's needed, why it's useful. Let's start off by taking a look at an example. Here I've got some code written in base R, and I'm working with the famous empty cars data set. I'm filtering some data, selecting some columns, and creating some new columns. Here I've got the uh, kilometers per liter, the weight in kilograms, and then finally I'm selecting some columns in a particular order and I get this resulting data set. So this is great. What's, what's the problem? Why, why, you know, why write poor man? Well, the problem with this code is that for, especially for new users, let's say that you're new to programming or maybe you're coming from Excel or SPSS, something like that. Looking at code such as this can be particularly jarring. There's a lot of subtleties going on here that you need to understand and it can be quite tricky when you're first looking at this kind of code and that that makes the barrier to entry quite high and to the to the extent that actually uh, some training courses that I've seen these days actually skip over base and just start with tidyverse speaking of which let's take a look at the dplyr alternative or equivalent even so here I have the exact same result I start off with my data set empty cars then I filter the rows I select some columns and then finally I create some new columns putting them in a particular order. And this is great. This, this offers us this human readable API. And this, this is one of the key points that poor man tries to recreate. Um, it's ultimately what makes dplyr so popular. It really breaks down that barrier to entry, uh, especially when you have these really cool initiatives such as Tidy Tuesday as well, which offer examples of different data sets and give you the opportunity to work with these APIs and learn from other people, see how people you know, work with this API, how to produce these analysis sets. They can be a really great way for a new user to be onboarded with R. So human readable code reduces the barrier to entry. This is the first key point that I want to make today. So let's consider some scenarios now. Let's say, for example, you're doing some analysis and you are rerunning some code, it all works great. A few, few weeks go by, a few months maybe, maybe even a year. And all of a sudden you have to go back and rerun that code. Maybe you work in the financial industry and you get audited and you have to show how you got some particular financial results. So you go back to your script, you start running it and, oh no, something doesn't work. How annoying is that? Well, this is probably because maybe you installed a newer version of a package and something in that package broke. It's not necessarily the code that you wrote. Another classic example is, let's say you write some code and you share it with a colleague or a coworker. But, I oh know, it doesn't work on their machine. How annoying is that? Why? You know, it works perfectly fine on your machine, but it doesn't work on theirs. It's classic programming issues. Well, this is probably because you've got different package versions if you if you've got a, a dependency of a package maybe you know you have a different version and that's what's breaking the code finally let's let's say that you're working towards a deadline and something isn't working in your code um, you might want to start debugging that code okay so what what's going on is it is it my code is it the package that I'm working in and if it is the package that you're working with what happens if you don't understand how that package works? It can you know, really add to the time that it takes to be able to understand where the problem lies. Uh, and ultimately, if you're working towards a deadline, that's, that can be quite problematic. And this is where you get into something that I like to call dependency hell. Because ultimately, if you are adding these dependencies to your package, if you, uh, sorry, to, to your analysis, if you're adding a package, you really need to think do I definitely need this package for my analysis to run? Can I use something else? Can I, can I work with base? Because ultimately, dependencies are an open invitation for other people to break your code. You know, if, 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 if a package maintainer or developer changes something in that package and it breaks your code, then it's not really their fault. They're well within their rights to do that. But 
ultimately this is going to be quite annoying for you you know if something breaks you have to take the time to figure out okay well how is it broken where is it broken and this can really be difficult to track down these bugs so dependencies are an open invitation for other people to break your code please when you're adding these packages to your analysis to your project really think do you actually need it but of course dependencies aren't all that bad and you know we, we, we want this human readable API that we've been talking about. So, okay, we, we, you know, maybe we want to manage these dependencies in some way. And there are great solutions out there for that. There are tools such as Docker. Uh, maybe you want to go the R package route. So you might set up a Minicran server, or maybe you want to work more locally at the project level. So you might consider using RM or Packrat. But the, the, these solutions, they have a, they, they have problems themselves. Firstly, they are a dependency. You're adding another dependency to your solution. Um, they require prior knowledge that they even exist. Again, if you're a new user, maybe you're a new programmer, you might not have even seen these before. You might not have heard of them. So that means that they require time to learn. And then again, if we go back to that example where we're sharing code with a coworker or a colleague, all of a sudden, it's not just you that needs to spend the time and know about these 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 solutions and learn how to use them. You now need buy-in from your team members, from your colleagues, your coworkers. They have to spend time learning it. So these solutions, you know, they come with their own problems. Now, when we're talking about complex code bases, dplyr is one of them. If you've ever looked under the hood of dplyr, there is a lot of code there. There's a lot going on. It's a package that's written very very well. Um, you know, it's, it's a great package, but ultimately there is a lot of complex dispatches and abstraction that's going on to take away a lot of that uh, code and return things in a package-wide consistent manner. And this goes beyond dplyr itself. This this goes into packages such as rlang and vectors, which are dependencies of dplyr. But again, you know, it offers this package-wide consistency, so it's understandable why this happens. But there are other abstractions as well. For example, we have C and C++ code in, in dplyr. And if you, you know, that's a whole other language that you then need to learn to understand how these things work and how they fit together. So it can be really difficult to learn from the dplyr code base. As a side note, to my knowledge, there are no discussions of, you know, how these designs came about um, that are publicly available. There's no meeting minutes, for example. Um, and it can be particularly difficult to understand or reason with a decision that was made by the maintainers, especially if it's broken your code. You know, if, if something's broken, you think, well, this worked before, why have you changed it? And of course, ultimately, generic APIs are very, very difficult to design, right? Nobody gets these things right first time. Nobody's going to. Um, so the maintainers of dplyr and all of the tidyverse are well within their right to make these changes. So it's, it's not a bad thing on them. But ultimately, if you want to learn how they did it, you know, these, these complex code bases are difficult to learn from. And this is where poor man comes in. So poor man is a dependency free recreation of dplyr. And it does this in a completely unapologetic way. It really does just copy the dplyr API line, well, not line for line, but function for function. Um, and it does this all using base R. There's no C or C++. So you might be sitting there thinking, okay, well, what about speed? You know, how does it compare? Well, look, poor man is not trying to win any speed competitions. Poor man's focus is elsewhere. It's trying to create this human readable API in a dependency-free manner in a way in which people can learn from. And what's great about that, because it's written in, in base, we actually get a benefit in that it installs in seconds. Uh, whereas dplyr takes quite a while, for example. Now, within the poor man package, there is almost a full suite of dplyr functionality. I think there's maybe some experimental features which aren't available, but otherwise you pretty much get the full whack. And also there's a couple of other things brought in from the wider tidyverse. You've got tidy select, you've got magrita, you've got some tibble functionality. And to give you some confidence that this all works, there's over 700 tests written for poor man a lot of which have actually been ported over from dplyr itself. So hopefully that gives you a bit of confidence that poor man is able to do the job that it claims to do. Because ultimately, if you take a dplyr script, 
you swap out the library call at the top, library dplyr, for library poor man, you should still be able to run that script end to end. It should still all work completely fine. And this ultimately makes poor man a great teaching tool. Uh, it's much easier to install than dplyr, so if you're teaching to a wide audience, then it's much easier to get them to install one de dependency versus dplyr and all of its dependencies. And you can still go ahead and use all the great you know, tools, examples, tutorials, Tidy Tuesday, etc., etc., that are developed for dplyr with poor man, because it works end to end. You take that script, you swap out that library call, and it will still work. And what I've tried to do when I've developed this package, because ultimately it is a teaching tool, I've really tried to explain the design decisions that I've made and how I wrote certain elements of the package in my blog posts. So if you're interested after this talk, you can go and, and, and take a look at those and learn a little bit about how to develop such a generic API in base. All right, so let's take a look at some examples. So this is the same example from the, the start of the talk. Um, all, I, all I've done here is I've changed that, that library call from library dplyr to library poor man, and now I'm taking my data, you know, my empty cars, I'm filtering the data, I'm selecting my columns, and then I'm mutating. just want to highlight a couple of things here as well, because ultimately we get the same result, right? This pipe is not the Magrita pipe. This pipe is actually what I call the poor pipe. It's included in poor man, it's written in base. And we've got features such as starts with, so tidy select features. Um, again, written in base, included in poor man, and I've got a great blog post which explains how I implemented all of these things as well. So compare this to dplyr. Again, you can see it's the exact same script. It's just all I've done is I've, I've just changed this library call, and it still works. Poor man also offers some group by and uh, summarize functionality. So here I've got the iris data set. I'm going to group by the species column, and then I'm going to summarize across the sepal columns, calculating the means, and I get this nice aggregated output. Pullman also offers all of the join functionality. So here I've got a couple of data frames, data frame one, data frame two. Here I'm performing a, a mutating join, so I'm mutating data frame one by performing a left join, attaching the columns from data frame two. And then down here, I've got what's called a, a filter join. So I'm taking all of the rows from data frame one that don't have a match in data frame two. And then here's my resulting output. So take home messages. Human readable code reduces the barrier to entry for new users, new programmers. This human readable API that dplyr affords is re-implemented via poor man. And it's done in a dependency-free way, and this is important because dependencies are an open invitation for people to break your code. We can manage these solutions, but ultimately if we can reduce them, that's even better. And complex code bases can be quite difficult to learn from. dplyr has a lot of abstraction, it has a lot of dispatch that's going on. So poor man does this using base R, and that's a great way to learn from, from poor man how to work with base. Now I just want to leave you with this quote, which is, I'd seen my father, he was a poor man, and I watched him do astonishing things. Ultimately, this is a bit of a tongue-in-cheek thing. It's, it's When you do library poor man, you'll actually see this quote. Um, this is to say, well, yes, poor man is written in base, but base is fantastic. It's, it offers unrivaled, unparalleled levels of consistency. I can take a script that I wrote in base from, 20 years ago, from 10 years ago, and it'll still run today perfectly fine which might not necessarily be the case if you're working with one of these packages which is under constant development. So, I'll leave it there. Thanks everyone for listening. I'd like to invite you to uh, ask any questions which you may have now, but I'll leave you with a couple of links. Here you can see the links to install the package. It is available on CRAN, so you can go and install it from there, or you can in install the development version from GitHub. There's also a docker image that you can use as well if, if that's your jam. Um, I've also listed my blog here where you can go and learn about how I implement all these things. And finally, like I say, I am a freelance developer, so if you want to get in touch, here's my email address, my Twitter handle, and finally my LinkedIn profile. So again, thanks for listening. I'm now going to stop to take any questions. Thanks very much.